Today it's the National Press Club, former director of the US National Security Agency, Michael Rogers. The retired four-star admiral served in the top job under Presidents Obama and Trump, while at the same time heading the US Cyber Command. Admiral Rogers with today's Press Club address. Today's National Press Club address, uh, hosted by Westpac. I'm Andrew Tillett, uh, Federal Political Correspondent for the Australian Financial Review and Vice President here at the club. Our guest today is Admiral Mike Rogers, former US National Security Agency Chief. His address today is entitled, Russia and China, Geopolitics and the New cyber Global Cyber Challenge. After 37 years in the Navy, Admiral Rogers has taken his expertise in cryptology to the corporate world including serving on the advisory board for leading local cybersecurity company CyberCX. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at PressClubOst and our hashtag is NPC. Would you all please welcome my Admiral Mike Rogers to the stand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on the Nunawa people. And I wish to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. And I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending today's events at the National Press Club. And I very much apologize if I have mispronounced anything. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, it is an honor to be with you here today, and it's really a pleasure. First of all, I question your judgment. It is a Friday afternoon, and you are, <laughs> you are all here, and I'm thinking, I don't know about that. I also want to say um, not only thank you for, for being here, but amongst you are men and women that I spent many years working with and partnering with. And to be honest, it makes me happy to see that. The work that we did together to support our two nations and the broader set of friends and allies that we have around the world, quite frankly, fills me with pride and a sense of, hey, we, we made a difference. And I'm, can, it makes me really happy to see motivated men and women who continue to serve to make a difference. And remember, you don't have to wear a uniform or you don't have to work in government to make a difference. Motivated individual, individuals who are focused on generating outcomes can be found all across our societies and can make a difference no matter where they are. And I also want to thank CyberCX, because the reason I am here is a part of CyberCX's Global Advisory Board. Um, they were kind enough to ask me to participate, and I got involved for one simple reason. One of my takeaways from my time in government is that the private sector has a lot to add to cybersecurity and the cyber challenges that we face. And I'm always interested in trying to find organizations in the private sector that I think are focused and motivated on making a difference. Um, and so thanks, thanks very much, JP. Now, what I thought I'd do is I'm going to take it a little backwards. I want to talk first about cyber because I always tried to remind people when I was in government, now that I find myself in the private sector, cyber exists in a context. If you want to be effective with respect to cyber in terms of understanding it and increasing the probability of de developing strategies that are effective against it, you've got to stop and think about that context. Put another way, um, I defended networks for a living and I penetrated networks for a living. And one of the things I told the teams that I was a part of, remember, somewhere else in the world there is a man or woman sitting in a keyboard who is executing this activity. There is conscious thought, there is objective, there is strategy. If we can understand that, it increases the probability that we will be able to create more effective strategies, better responses, and we will increase the probability. So uh, let me start with cyber from a context perspective. Now, the reality is cyber has become a core dimension of a nation's national security as well as its economic competitiveness. We cannot separate cyber in this massive interconnected world that we have created, that we have underpinned entire economic business models around. We can't separate that from the implications of economic advantage for our nations, for the implications of our nation's security, and quite frankly, for our personal quality of life. We are all have bought into a system where we have literally digitized the, the most, in some ways, mundane daily aspects of life. 
in the ever more or ever ongoing quest to maximize efficiency, maximize our time, and increase our ability to do things in a whole lot of different environments, whether we're sitting in a car, we're walking, we're in the office, whatever. We are not going to walk away from that. So to me, one of the things I often hear in context is people will say to me, well, isn't the answer we need to reduce this dependency? We need to reduce this model. And my attitude is, guys, I don't think that's realistic. This model has created great advantage. It has created great learning, great transfer of knowledge, great economic activity. We are not going to walk away from that. So as we're thinking to ourselves, how do we create strategies to enhance the security of these structures we've created? I reject the premise that the answer is to fundamentally walk away from it in many ways. I also think that we need to think how cyber fits is in a tool. Because of that context, we need to think about how cyber fits as a potential tool in our national security strategies, in our engagement strategies. Another thing I used to say in my previous life was, you know, it doesn't matter how big your nation is. It doesn't matter what your GDP is. It doesn't matter what your population size is. There is literally not a nation on this globe that isn't focused in part on how it enhances its digital capability, whether that be for the state and its economy or whether that be for its individuals. That means to me, cyber represents not only challenge, but there's opportunity there. This is a great way for us, combined with other things, to enhance the relationship we have with nations, to increase the perceived value of who we are and what we do, to provide an alternative to the arguments that some other nations make. In my experience, we probably haven't thought about that as much as we need to. And I am hoping, as both our nations move forward, that in fact that is going to become a core part of our strategies. But remember, to make this work, we need not only investment, money, people, time. One of the biggest challenges I ever found in life was trying to maximize decision makers' bandwidth with respect to time. I always found that to be a challenging in this incredibly complex world we live in which our leaders have to deal with endless crisis after crisis. Because cyber to me is all about duration and sustainment. This is not about a series of really short campaigns. This is about a sustained long-term focus, long-term strategy, and a long-term investment. That is hard in democracies because our structures at times aren't, our political processes aren't always built that way. Um, and so it's always great to me where I see political leaders who acknowledge this is something that transcends party and politics because we need to look at this through the prism of our security, our economic well-being, the, the well-being and the effectiveness and the quality of life of our citizens. I think that's something very powerful. I, I also think one of my takeaways that'll shape my follow-on comments, so to speak. Both my, based on my 37 years in uniform and the four years I have spent in the private sector since then, uh, they just, that collective experience continues to reinforce cyber is the ultimate team sport for me. I have never dealt with a, an, an issue or an area in which outcomes were so tied to the ability to bring together multiple entities, multiple perspectives, and uh, multiple elements within society. Government cannot do this by itself. The private sector cannot do it by itself. We need the academic world and the power of thought and research to help us conceptualize and understand what is it we're doing, why are we doing it, and where are we trying to go. We cannot, I was very proud of you know, leading the largest intelligence organis organization in the Five Eyes structure. Quite frankly, if we're honest, it was the largest intelligence organization in the world, not headquartered in Pyongyang, Beijing, Tehran, or Moscow. And yet, I would always tell the team, you can take pride in size, but it isn't enough. And so let's not forget, we cannot do this. We can't execute our mission without others. And so as we think about that broader context, I, I think it's interesting, as we look at what are our, both of our nations at the moment, doing to address this broader context. And the two of the things, and there are only two of many items, but the first thing that comes to my mind is AUKUS and the Quad. And I look to myself, and I think to myself, you know, it is not by chance that cyber and cybersecurity is an element in both the Quad structure and AUKUS. That is not by chance, and it is reflective of this idea 
Cyber is foundational to the future. It isn't some specialized technical area that exists by itself. It's not something that we should be doing in isolation. It's something that we have to make part of our broader strategy. And we have to sustain that effort, as I said. And so I draw great comfort from that. I think that's a really powerful set of directions. I want to focus for a minute on AUKUS, because that seems to be getting the most attention at the moment, both here in Australia as well as the United States, a great topic of discussion. Um, and I'm, I'm struck by a, a few takeaways. The first is we need to remember that AUKUS is about much more than acquiring nuclear submarines for Australia. As important as that is, as significant an investment as that is, that's not all AUKUS is about. In fact, in some ways to me, potentially, the most powerful dimensions of AUKUS are the other things that the agreement talks about. It talks about cyber. It talks about emerging technologies. It talks about the human dimension. And I think to myself, guys, if we can make strong progress in those areas, we're really creating the foundation, potentially, for a different future, hopefully one in which we can retain advantage. So I, I try to urge people, please just don't think AUKUS as a submarine acquisition program. The second point I would make is remember AUKUS is more than just government. As I always remind people in the United States, guys, governments don't build nuclear, as an example, governments don't build nuclear submarines. Companies build submarines. They build the weapons that are within those submarines. They build the combat systems and the sensors that are within those submarines. So we need to make sure that as we're moving forward, private industry in both our nations is a part of this AUKUS framework. Again, it goes to my point about how cyber is the ultimate team sport. And AUKUS needs to reflect that to me, not just with respect to cyber, not just res with respect to the submarine dimension, but with that broader set of challenges that it outlines. I think, to me, it's very powerful to, to look at it that way. I'd also say, remember, AUKUS is about much more than just acquisition and just more, a lot more than just hardware and software. There are some really interesting dimensions potentially in that framework about human capital, about individuals, about how we maximize the ability of those three nations, Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States, to maximize human capital. Because the good Lord knows when it comes to cybersecurity, I don't think there's a single organization in this room that would say, yep, we got all the people we need. Human capital is not an issue for us. And not only do we not have the people that we need today, guys, organizations in this room are growing. Doesn't matter if you're in government, doesn't matter if you're in the private sector. Everyone is trying to increase the human capital dimension of their cyber and cybersecurity efforts. That is not a short-term phenomenon to me. I tell you, I, I used to tell when I was in government, the teams that I was a part of, I don't see this human capital shortfall as a short-term problem. We're going to have to figure out how we, how we address this, but it's going to take time. So put another way, I used to tell the teams, do not come to me with strategies that are built around the idea, sir, if we only had you know, a thousand more people, we'd be exactly where we need to be. I'm going, guys, you know how long it would take us to bring a thousand more people into this organization, to train them, to get them experience, to take the actions to make sure that we actually retain them, not just train them? said, guys, we, we've got to build strategies that aren't just predicated on massive injections as human capital, even as we and, and others in this room were aggressively building up, bringing people on board. I'm not saying that it, it's not an objective to bring more people on board. Um, I also think we need to remember as we look at AUKUS from a cybersecurity perspective, AUKUS is going to be an impressive collection target. Quite frankly, if I saw similar activity in some nations around the world in my former life, I'd be really interested in it. And I'd be trying to understand it to help my nation as they were trying to understand it, develop policy alternatives, talk to military commanders about what are the implications of this activity. I fully expect other nations are going to do the same. And so we need to be mindful of that. <laughs> we need to build that into this from the beginning. The last two points I want to make about AUKUS are i only speak for myself, and I have said this to the leadership of the United States that is involved with AUKUS. We need to make AUKUS an engine for innovation. We should not be using this to reinforce the status quo. We should be using this as a vehicle to enhance a better outcome, potentially using different approaches. 
It's amazing what you can do when you have the leaders of three significant nations aligned on a purpose, an outcome, and a set of objectives. As, as a guy like many of you who may have spent some time in bureaucracies, I used to remind the team, it's amazing what you can do when the boss is really focused on this objective and the pressure is on you. Hey, you gotta deliver, we gotta meet the timelines. Um, lastly, and in some ways, the one I'm most hopeful about, and again, I've, I've said this repeatedly in the United States, I want AUKUS to be a vehicle for change. I said, guys, you look at, and I'll only speak for the United States, you look at the policies and the practices that we have put in place to address from a US perspective, the flow of technology and human, and human capital from the United States to the rest of the world and from the rest of the world to the United States, we are not optimized for the world of the 21st century. The structures in the United States we created all reflect a time when the United States was the leader in technology, when the United States was you know, the, the leader in many ways, not totally, in, in the companies and the businesses that actually took that technology, that monetized it, and then took it to scale on a global basis. Um, quite frankly, we, we didn't look to the outside world for technologies. Our view generally was, hey, we can do this. Could we say that today? I don't think so. That to me reflects a very different time and a very different place. And yet, we created a set of policies that were predicated on that idea. So we intentionally said to ourselves, so we've got this amazing advantage. We need to make sure we retain that advantage. This means we want to be very mindful and very restrictive of the way we allow that technology to flow to the outside world. And to compound that, we tended to take a one-size-fits-all approach. It doesn't matter what nation you are. Hey, we've got this set of policies that you need to match the policies if you want the information or the technology to flow your way. Likewise, we said to ourselves, you know, We've developed this technology. We have these amazing companies. We've got this amazing set of capacities. We really don't need capacity from the outside world so much. So let's develop a policy and set of policies in some ways that makes it more difficult for human capital, intellectual property, business activity to flow from other nations into the United States. And again, I, I go, I understand why we did this 40 years ago. That's not the way the world is today. And I think to myself, think about one of the implications of AUKUS. Undersea warfare is the one, as a warfighter, as a military, former military guy, undersea, the undersea domain is the one area, arguably, from a United States perspective, where we believe we have and can sustain supremacy in that environment. So we have been very careful about sharing technology within that environment, because we think that's a core warfighting an operational advantage for us. And yet, we have entered into an agreement, which I fully support and believe in, that opens that technology to another nation. If we're willing to share that kind of technology with Australia, could you explain to me why we have all these other restrictions on things that are much lesser to me in terms of risk, that quite frankly, we could actually increase capability? In the United States, we've really got to rethink this. And so personally, I am hoping that AUKUS becomes this vehicle for change. Because again, as a former uh, you know, government guy, I, I would say nothing helps to drive change when you got bosses really interested and really aligned. And when you're constantly being badgered, okay, where are we in the timeline? What's the progress report? What's holding us up? Lastly, along those lines with respect to AUKUS, we got to be very honest and upfront with us in this process. I'll just focus on the nuclear submarine piece for purposes of this discussion. Submarines are incredibly complex things. I say this as an individual who has done work and missions on submarines. I actually have my eldest son was a US nuclear submarine officer in the American Navy for about eight years. So I've seen this as a participant on submarines and I've seen this as a parent as my son talked about his life on submarines. And I will tell you, incredibly capable platforms, endurance, sustainability, distance, speed to get to the area of interest but they are complex. And in building them and acquiring, it takes time. And time is not on our side right now. And so one of the things I think we be, need to be very honest with ourselves about is, so what are the impediments to the timelines that we have identified? We need to identify those impediments early and we need, those, we need to bring those impediments to the attention of our senior most decision makers. We cannot allow bureaucracy to drive this process. Put another way, Asking bureaucracy to heal itself or change its behavior has a low probability of success in my experience. 
and, and, and I'm always interested in how can we maximize that. Lastly, I want to focus the, the last two things. I want to talk Russia and China for a minute. Russia, because I think there's some really interesting implications for cyber as you look at what's going on in Ukraine right now. The first is what's going on in Ukraine from a cyber perspective to Mike Rogers, and I speak only as Mike Rogers, I believe shows that we need to change our frame of reference a little bit about cyber. We tend to view cyber as unless there is visible significant or catastrophic impact, there must not be much going on. So I'm constantly hearing people right now say, doesn't seem like there's much cyber activity going on in, in this whole Russia-Ukraine thing. People, everything seems to be working. I have to admit, I still find it amazing. You know, I, I will do Zooms with, I've done Zooms with academics in Kyiv in the middle of a war in their country. And I have to admit, that just strikes me as, boy, this is amazing. We're sustaining infrastructure in the face of this kind of activity. There is a lot of cyber activity going on where the Russians are attempting to interdict the flow, the connectivity of both data, functionality, but the Ukrainians to date have managed to show a high level of cyber resilience. I think we ought to be asking ourselves why and how. How does a nation facing literally, uh, uh, cyber is a dimension of an armed conflict, how is it able to continue to sustain and maintain its functionality, its connectivity, and control of its data in the face of that kind of activity. I think there's some lessons that we can take for that. Hey, it's still the early days, and I acknowledge that we're all gonna be studying this, but I, I really think there's some interesting takeaways. The first one that comes to my mind is, and I don't know the answer yet, but I ask myself, is there some form of cyber deterrence ongoing? Because the Russians, as active as they have been in Russia and the Ukraine, have not so far active to, opted to go really destructive outside Ukraine with respect to cyber. It appears, and I could well be wrong, we'll see how this plays out over time, but it appears to date that they have decided that expansion of this conflict into other domains at the moment, outside Ukraine at the moment, is not in their strategic interests. We'll see if that calculation changes. We'll see if perhaps there's activity been going on that we don't yet recognize. But for right now, I, I wonder why. Is there some level of deterrence going on? That's one, I don't know the answer, but it's something we really need to pay attention to. The second one and the most powerful to me is I'm watching two nations, Russia and Ukraine, who decided that cyber was going to be a core component of this conflict and who very early said to themselves, you know, we lack sufficient capability and capacity. And look at what they did in response. The Russians aligned government, military, and the intelligence sector. They went to the private cybersecurity sector within Russia and said, hey, we need your help. We need your help to defend our nation's infrastructure and our systems. They went to their populace and said, look, if you have hacking skills, if you're a cyber defender, come be part of our patriotic hacking army. They also went to surrogate groups like criminals hey, we need to augment, we need more capacity. We need you to now in some ways act as an extension of the state with respect to the application of cyber capability. Ukraine took a slightly different approach, one that I think is really worth us digging deeper into. They too decided we don't have enough capacity, we don't have enough capability. They too decided we need to make sure that government military is aligned. We need to ensure that our private sector in Ukraine, those private cybersecurity and IT firms are involved in our effort. They too went to the broad public and said in Ukraine, if you have a set of capabilities and you wanna make a difference and you wanna support our fight against this Russian aggression, we have a place for you. Whether you wanna do it as a penetrator, as a hacker, you wanna do it as a defender, we've got room for you. But they did two other things to me that are really interesting. They went to the broader world and said the exact same thing. We don't care if you're Ukrainian. If you want to make a difference, if you are somewhere out there in the world and you believe that you have a set of skills in cyber, whether it be for purposes of hacking or purposes of defending, we've got a place for you. And guess what? You don't have to come to Kyiv to be a part of this effort. With this amazing connectivity that we have created and sustained globally, you can be a part of this from wherever you live or work. The second thing they did, which perhaps is the most powerful thing of all, they went to the private IT and cybersecurity capabilities within the corporate world outside Ukraine. 
So think about the Microsofts, think about the CrowdStrikes, think about others who have publicly acknowledged, hey, we are supporting, we are helping with cybersecurity for Ukraine. So literally, for the first time in an armed conflict, we are seeing the two primary combatants crowdsource cyber offense and cyber defense. We have never seen that before. I look at that and I go, you know, there's some aspects of it I fundamentally reject. I, I'm not interested in hiring surrogate groups like criminal groups, you know, to act as hackers, if you will, for something I would be involved in. Uh, uh, likewise, I, I do get a little, a little worried about if we're gonna bring others into this, what level of control do we maintain? Um, because we don't wanna lose something in which the second and third order effects suddenly create problems that no one anticipated. That's not good. But I do say to myself, is there a model about how we can align private sector capacity and capability in cybersecurity and IT, as well as OT? Can we align that in a different way with the government? And by doing so, can we create an enhanced level of cybersecurity and cyber resilience? I look at Ukraine and I go, you guys have created an amazing cyber resilience. That's what we need to do. Now, the other point I would make is, I sure hope that it doesn't take a war to get us there. Sometimes there's nothing like catastrophic loss to compel individuals and organizations to think, well, maybe we need to try something different. I hope it doesn't take that. Although I will say, we have had you know, systems penetrated, data stolen, data locked down, major infrastructure, take it my own nation, think about Colonial Pipeline, we physically have infrastructure that's been locked down, we've had private sector, think about Sony, physically attacked and destroyed through cyber within my own nation, and yet it still hasn't been enough in some ways to push a fundamental shift. And one of the things I used to think about, and I still do, is, so what does it take? Do we have to get to, is it some pain threshold? It's a particular sector, it's a particular impact, it's a particular monetary amount? Is it actual harm? Is it actual loss of life? Boy, I sure hope it doesn't get there, but uh, we need to think about it. And so I, I hope as we go forward, we ask ourselves, what can we learn? What's going on in Ukraine? How have they, how have they been able to achieve and sustain this high level of resilience in the face of quite a determined level of effort directed against it? I think that's something really powerful for us to learn. I, I also think that we need um, to think about Again, let me step back to that context piece. I want to shift now. We talked about Russia. We talked about that context. We talked about cyber. Um, you, you can't be anywhere these days, particularly my old, my old life, if you don't talk about China. So let's talk about China for a little bit. First, you know, I view China, if you will, as a competitor. I do not want us to get to a position where they become an adversary or an enemy. That is not a good place for us to be. It's not a good place for them to be. Now, I'll be honest and tell you, if we don't change the trends, that's the direction we're going. That's not a good thing. We gotta figure out how we continue to compete, but also, quite frankly, how we change behavior. I acknowledge that. The reason we are going in this negative direction, in my opinion, is because of some of the behaviors that we're seeing. Now look, I believe that it is incredibly appropriate, reasonable, and in fact, in line with history, that China be strong. I believe it's perfectly appropriate that China have one of the, if not the largest economy in the world. That personally doesn't intimidate me or bother me. I don't get upset when I see China investing in the military. What concerns me is behavior and the way those investments are being used. That's what I would argue we need to focus on. It's behavior that we should object to. It's activity and actions that we should highlight is unacceptable, not government not culture, not individuals. That's not what this is about. In some ways, we have tended to frame this competition, if you will, as something between democracy and autocracy. Now, my belief is really, this is a little different to me. This is much more about two competing models about the application of power by a nation state. One argues, the sovereign state's power should be applied in measures that meet its security and its needs, and that international law should not be allowed to override the legitimate security concerns of a nation. 
In essence, to me, that is the China argument. You can't tell me to forget about my own sovereign requirements. And you can't use this legal framework that you have created to somehow override what I believe to be are my very legitimate concerns. The United States, Australia, others, on the other hand, argue, wait a second. This is about the application of power within a context that recognizes international law, the norms of behavior that we've developed over the last 75 years in the post-World War II environment, and that also acknowledges the rights of individuals when applying that power, and I would also argue looks to see how we can use these structures, these organizations that we have created to try to address major problems. How can we use them as part of the solution set? So to me, I'm watching two very different models for the application of power, and in some ways, we're talking past each other. You saw this when the Chinese reaction to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which they label as a special operation, which they do not recognize as a war, which they do not recognize as illegal or inappropriate. In fact, if you look at the first statements they made, they talked about the parties need to, rec need to recognize the sovereignty and the issues. Now, in the West, we generally looked at that and said, so that means you would be against this, right? Because you'd be concerned about the sovereignty of the Ukraine and the fact that its integrity and its um, boundaries were violated with armed force in an arbitrary manner, in a legal manner, by another nation state. And I remind the Americans I don't know, no, guys, that's not what they were talking about. They were talking about the sovereign rights of Russia to use its power in a way that addresses what they believe is a legitimate security concern. And again, guys, we got competing models and we're talking past each other. Therefore, I think it's a reminder that it's about behavior and it's not about ideology. We, we also need to do more than just say one side's good and one side's bad. We have got to provide an alternative. It reminds me about the, the, the issue of 5G, where quite frankly, Australia took a, a lead in, in my previous life. I was here multiple times during that time frame, you know, talked with your nation's leadership, as did many in this room. Um, you know, opinion was asked about what do you think, policy, what are the trade-offs, is there a way to mitigate this? Um, I was very impressed, both in Australia and the United States, with the fact that I thought we addressed a very valid national security and economic advantage concern, and we did it very publicly and very directly. I'll only speak for my nation. Where I was a little frustrated was, okay, so what are we doing to make sure this doesn't happen again? Because right now, it's 5G technology. In another three years, it'll be 6G. Coming down the road, it'll be quantum. It'll be artificial intelligence. How did we get to a position in the West, but specifically Australia and America, where the very telecommunications, Wi-Fi, the very technology that the West developed, that the West achieved the standardization approvals, and that the West monetized in these form of these massive companies, how, in the course of literally one generation, 4G to 5G, did we lose the ability to compete we should stop, step back and ask ourselves, how did this happen, why, and what do we have to do to make sure it doesn't happen again? And I, I think that's a, big, that's a big focus for us in the future as, as we're going forward. So let me close with two last, last thoughts. As we're working our way forward in cyber, cybersecurity, this broader geopolitical and national security context that I talked about, remember what I believe are our two greatest advantages. Because I always thought, as a military guy, you build your strategies around your strengths. And you try to put those strategies in a way that, quite frankly, that maximize the disadvantages and the vulnerabilities of the other side. The greatest strengths to me that we enjoy in Australia and the United States are, number one, our values. This concept of the right of the individuals, of freedoms, of the fact that in our societies you are not bound by class. You can create a future for yourself and for your family if you are willing to work hard enough. I am the grandson of a Welsh coal miner who left a little village north of Cardiff as an 18-year-old in 1925 who came through Ellis Island. He didn't know any, well, I would talk to him when I was a kid growing up, and I'd say, grandfather, what was it? You left everything you knew. You left this village that you and your father and your brother and your 
this, your predecessors, it's the only place they'd ever lived. It's the only place you ever knew. I would ask him, did you ever leave the village? And he said, hey, going down to Cardiff was a big, that was a big deal. He said, uh, to be honest, we never really went, I never really went far beyond that. Um, and he said to me, we, we didn't really know anybody in the United States, but we had this image, this idea of the United States. And my, his father and his mother, he said, decided we need to be advantage, uh, take advantage of that. We can create a better lives for ourselves. Put another way, I, I try to remind Americans, and Australia is similar. Look, we are both nations built on immigration. We are both nations that are built on the idea that we have something that others want to be a part of. In the United States, I remind people, look, literally, people are willing to endanger their safety, their well-being, and that of their children to get to us. That is something incredibly powerful. And as we, even as we're developing policies to very appropriately address how that happens, we don't want to forget the power of that. That is huge advantage for us. The second thing I would highlight is alliance and partnerships. And that's why we are all here today. This Australia-US relationship, the broader set of alliances, partnerships, and relationships that our two nations have, China, Russia, they can't match that. There is a reason for that. To me, these alliances, these partnerships are built on something more foundational than achieving advantage. They're about a common set of goals, about values, about a vision of the world around us, and about the willingness to try to extend ourselves beyond ourselves to make a difference. That is so powerful. Those two things, they give us a great starting point. In closing, let me just talk for a minute about the value of this relationship. It has done amazing things over the course of, you know, uh, at least a century now. Now, we often frame this relationship from a military perspective. Hey, the first Americans in the First World War, our first actual battlefield engagement under Australian command. Second World War, over a million Americans passed through Australia. Collectively, we come together to say, look, the Japanese are, are, are a massive threat. We have got to come together. And we lost so many individuals to do it. But our nation's focused. We set a goal for ourselves, and we we're willing to make the commitment to achieve it, regardless of the incredible high price that it caused for both of us. That continued in Vietnam. It continued in Korea. It continued in the Gulf War. It continued in the post-9-11 environment. But I remind people, don't think about this relationship just in the context of armed conflict. It is much stronger and much more foundational and longer lasting. You look at these relationships we've created, Quad, AUKUS. It's not by chance to me that of the seven nations that are involved in these two efforts, only two are in both, Australia and the United States. We've entered into these new arrangements, not because we're worried about a war, but because, quite frankly, we think by partnering and working together at an even greater level, we can achieve better outcomes for both our nations. We can help the Indo-Pacific region. And quite frankly, we can help the broader world that we're a part of. And we're willing to do this even in the face of inflation, fuel prices, et cetera, all those challenges that are very real in our day-to-day -day lives that impact every one of us in our lives, whether we personally, as a parent, et cetera. And yet, we say to ourselves, we'll deal with those challenges. But one of the ways we're going to deal with the challenges of the broader world around us, we're going to do it together. That is incredibly, incredibly powerful to me. And it's a compliment to me to both our nations that we're willing to do that. And I want to thank everyone here in this room, and I thank all of you on, in the television audience for your commitment to that. But a reminder, any relationship, we all know this from our personal lives, every relationship requires an investment, OK? You just can't take it for granted. So we all need to be focused on supporting this relationship, reminding, that, reminding ourselves that we have to sustain it over time. But I thank you all very, very much for your attention and your time, and I look forward to our conversation and the questions. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Admiral, for your speech. A lot, a lot there to unpack. Um, I'll go to China. Uh, obviously, a very big concern for Australia. Um, you talked about competition with China and about being behaviour and not 
ideology. How does the the West and and you I guess you sort of touch upon this with the the importance of alliances. But how how how, how does the West convince China to change its behaviour, and is China capable of changing its behaviour? So I think there's there's no one single component to this. Number one, I, I, and it's not just China. I would say this in general with any nation. Number one, we show that there's a price to pay for unacceptable behavior. That's exactly, for example, what you're seeing in, in Ukraine with Russia right now. Collectively, the, the broader world has said, this is totally unacceptable. We're not going to sit here. We are prepared to respond and support the efforts to ensure that you fail in this illegal, immoral, and unlawful invasion. So there's a component of how do you, you know, commit to, in some parts, creating a measure of pain to show, hey, look, it, we're just not going to support it. We're not going to put up with it. But likewise, you also make sure, look, you remind other parties, but there are acceptable paths where we can work together. There are ways that we can both benefit from this. Again, it's why I don't want to get into, personally, the adversary and the enemy idea. Because when you get to that framework, your thought process is totally different. And you start to really narrow the margins and what you're willing to consider and what you're willing to do. And I want our aperture to be wide. And at this stage of where we are, I want us to be thinking about what can we do to try to stop that from happening. Um, it's also important that we've got to be consistent that what we say is also reflected in what we do. And sometimes that isn't always one of our strengths. And we really need to pay attention to that. Thank you. Uh, first question is from Anna Henderson. Thank you, Anna Henderson, SBS World News and NITV. Uh, there's a group of federal MPs across the government, the opposition and the crossbench who are calling for the Australian government to formally ask the US to drop the charges against Julian Assange. I so you want to, to start out with an easy one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I might not get another chance. Come on, let's go. <laughs> so you knew it was I coming. wanted to ask you what your view is of of the risks and challenges associated with that for, for a foreign government to make that request of an ally? And do you think that at this point that the US would entertain considering that given your background? So the first part, with friends and allies, I would argue you should not necessarily feel constrained. And if you make the determination that it is in the best interest of your nation, you shouldn't necessarily feel constrained from asking. Look, we went to the United Kingdom, for example, and said, look, the United States, we believe he should be extradited. Mm. You know, they could have said, oh, hey, this is problematic for us and instead. Or they could have said, why are you asking me? You're, you're placing me in a bad... That's not what happened. We made the request. It went through their process. The second part of this is, you know, I often get asked, every individual is afforded the due process of the legal frameworks we're a part of, and that is true for him. And I accept that, I believe that, because I think that makes us stronger as a society. But I also believe in the importance of accountability. So he should get his time to make his argument, and we'll see what a court believes. I've definitely got an opinion, and I hope the court decides one way, but in the end, hey, I'll leave that up to the court. That is what the rule of law does. That's not my job. What they argue is that it serves no useful purpose to extradite him now. Why do you argue that that's not true? Uh, because I believe in the concept of accountability. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next question from Chris Ullman. Admiral Chris Ullman, Nine News. You point out that the strength that we have as an alliance is our values. One of the calculations that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin make is that the West is in catastrophic decline. And a proof point for that might be the attack on democracy by the former American president and the fact that half... We want to keep this role going yeah. of really <laughs> easy questions. <laughs> and, that, and that half of Congress well now apparently signs up to the idea that that election was stolen. So what confidence can we have in the strength of the United States that we might won't see a collapse of democracy there? You want to see the strength of the United States? Look at a coalition that was formed in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine that made NATO, not just the US. NATO is even stronger today than it was six months ago. NATO is expanding beyond what it was six months ago. I, I personally say, guys, look, no one should doubt that the broad alliance and partnership that the United States is a part of is somehow incapable of action or somehow cannot achieve either relevance or cohesion. Now, there is no doubt 
Putin, Xi Jinping, and others believe, well, they can't sustain that over time. You know, hey, what you're seeing in the United States domestically, what you've seen in elections in some nations show you, look, they're, they're, they're torn apart with division. I, I try to highlight there is no doubt that the society I'm a part of has never been so divided in many ways, it, it, certainly in my life. Um, on the other hand, I take great pride in that has not gotten to the point where it has stopped us from executing the responsibilities and the policies we believe of a nation state. The other point I would make is it's one thing to me that is sometimes lost on the events of January 6th. The process worked, individuals did, the, did their job, and even in the face of an armed attempt to usurp the Constitution and our legal processes, it failed. And it failed because good Americans who might have different political opinions but believe in the power of law, the Constitution, and the legal frameworks that govern our nation, said that's what matters, and that's what we're going to focus on. So I try to remind people, as bad as the 6th of, of January was, and it, it was, and we need to investigate it and understand it because we want to make sure it doesn't happen again. But I also think, guys, we need to never forget it failed. It failed for a reason. The system and the individuals in it proved stronger. So I look at that and go, guys, I still remain positive about the future, even as I acknowledge we are certainly a much more divided society than we have been in a while. That might be an aberration, though, for what we saw on January 6, where you say the system withheld the, the, the irresistible force of Donald Trump. But what happens if um, he is re-elected in 2024? Could, can American democracy, the American system, um, withstand a second. I believe our system is more powerful than any one man. And I say this as an individual who served in the government under both President Obama and President Trump and worked directly with both of them. Who is in the Mueller report is the only DOD active duty individual because I, for example, told the President of the United States I will not do something that he wanted me to do. I look at that and I go, guys, our system is stronger than individuals. As long as we all do our jobs, we remember our roles, and we are mindful of the legal constructs that we're a part of, and we never forget what is it we took the oath to. You take, in our system, you take the oath to the Constitution of the United States to defend the, the, to defend the nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic, okay? Not to a party, not to a position, not to an individual. And so uh, the other thing I try to remind people is, look, again, if we do our jobs, if we remember what we're about, we, do, if we remember the law, we'll get through it. I also try to remind people, look, we're focused on this right now appropriately so, but as I like to tell my own family, guys, if you look back at American history, we had people dueling in the chambers of our legislative branch. <laughs> we had people shot. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to minimize this. I'm, I'm just trying to say, guys, if we look at this in a historic context, there is history in our nation where, quite frankly, we went to these extremes that now we would look at and go, oh, my God, how the heck did that happen? Well, it reflected a time and place. And sadly, what's going on now also reflects in a time and place. But as long as we remember those fundamentals I talked about, we're going to be okay, I believe. Okay, uh, Andrew Green. Ad Admiral Rogers, Andrew Green <clears throat> from the ABC. Uh, there appears to be a bit of a debate in the intelligence community in your country about the definition of influence operations mm. as uh, undertaken by China opposed to Russia. Do you think that's a problem? Do you think there's a good reason for that? Can you get your, can we get your insights on? So first of all, I am not part of the, of the organization anymore, so I'm not gonna talk about what, hey, what their views are, because quite frankly, I'm not part of that process, so I'm just not smart about what their views are. I will say the Russians have done, they've done this for decades, for a long time. The Russians always believe that information as a component of an influence campaign was incredibly powerful and quite frankly, generated positive outcomes. There's a reason why they've been doing this for decades. They believe it is effective and it achieves, or at least improves, um, the situation they're trying to address. You saw that really play out, you know, just in the near term in the 2016 election process. You continue to see that today. I believe China has looked at that and decided, you know, this whole information influence strategy and idea, there's something there that we need to be paying attention to. So I will say I've watched China a little bit more aggressive in the information and the influence arena in the last 18 months. And if I, if I go back, you know, four or five years ago when I was watching it every day, um, then that period. And I, but I apologize, I'm just not smart about the quote internal discussion right now. Do you see any difference though in their approaches? Um, 
uh, scale is very different. I, I would argue the Russians are still bigger in scale. Um, the, it seemed to me at times the Russians were very much interested in trying to drive and shape outcomes. At times, I thought it was a little bit more trying to understand the dynamics as well as influence the dynamics with the PRC, if, that make, if I'm articulating that, that well. Thank you. Is the, is the Chinese one perhaps a little less, less sophisticated at this stage, do you think? Or are they, are they getting better at... Well, part of it is, remember, they just... The Russians, as I said, they have been doing this for decades. So, quite frankly, it's a core skill set for them, and they're very good at it, and they have capacity and capability. It's a little bit newer in some ways. Thank you. Uh, Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross, Canberra IQ. You, uh, you conjured the image of the cyber antagonist, a person at a keyboard. Uh, probably in a fairly dark room with a few screens in front of him or her, probably in a room that could be underground or in a nondescript building. Uh, I want to... But there's a physical uh, dimension to uh, cyber security, and I'm particularly conscious of that because Canberra IQ's website happens to be hosted in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I so wouldn't I'm, trust those Oklahomans, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do, I do, as a matter of fact, but it's the, it's the undersea cables. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not only Canberra IQ's, uh, a, a kind of Canberra IQ's business continuity issues, it's the fact that 95% roughly of, right. of international data transfer goes through these cables. And they're out there in the middle of nowhere, in, in, under the ocean, vulnerable as. And as Australia is concerned, uh, the... Uh, uh, all the, inter all the overseas cables come into Australia in two points off in Sydney and one in Perth. So there's an immense vulnerability. Uh, can, you, uh, can you give us an assessment of how that vulnerability is, uh, is managed and protected against and defended? And if there is a breach or an attack, is there redundancy through space or something else? So I... I'm not knowledgeable about the specifics of Australia. I'll try to answer that from a U.S. perspective. Sure. So from a government perspective in the U.S., we paid great attention to, first, making sure we understand the vulnerabilities and the way the system works. Secondly, we've tried to identify, given that, given that structure, how do we ensure we enhance the monitoring and situational awareness of what's going on around it, within it, on top of it, so to speak? So we put more resources associated with monitoring activity around it. We also acknowledge, look, there's multiple components to this. You can go after the cables. If you want to try something deep, you can go after the cables in, deep, in shallower water. You can go after the cables at landfall. So we always try to remind ourselves there, there is both a physical dimension to this. That, that physical dimension has a lot of different components of it. Don't just fixate on the cables. You can defeat the whole system, for example, if you get the shore landings and you're able to disable them physically, for example. And then don't forget that there's also a significant cyber dimension to all of this. Now, can overhead replicate the volume, the functionality, and the speed of the terrestrial cable network in the world today? No. If it all went away, you can't replicate it at capacity today. Can you augment outages associated with specific components of that underwater global cable system? Yes, and that, that happens routinely. Look, we take cables, again, used to be involved in some of this in a previous life, cables go down for maintenance, cables go down because they're being replaced. It, it's not as if, um, you know, it's just like pipelines. We, we shut down pipelines for maintenance, we shut down pipelines at times because we're expanding them, we shut down pipelines at times because we re, we're rerouting them. We just try to make sure that when we're doing that, We've addressed the water capacity issue. Hey, can the rest of the system take it up? So if a malicious actor was planning a, a serious attack and planted some destructive devices on cables, whether in the middle of the ocean or other places, is the, are there systems and technologies to, uh, to, to discover that? There are some things, again, I'm not going to go into specifics because it's in, Well, go into the specifics, come very, on. It's very <laughs> Get a bit of sensitive. There are, there are methodologies in place to attempt to monitor activities around cables. That's, that's all I'll say. Being watched. Um, our ne next question is from Kim Bergman. Uh, Kim Bergman from Asia Pacific Defence Reporter. Thank you, Admiral. That was very hey, Can I just ask a process question? Does, does the audience get to ask questions or is it only me? <laughs> Honestly, I'm just asking. I, I don't know. Oh, if we've got time, we can. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Open mic night. Because you guys should have the opportunity. Yeah. Sir. 
Well, we try and do it on behalf of everyone. Oh, there you that, go. That, that's, that's the, <laughs> Kim, Kim is very, that's, that, very we, accomplished. We, yeah. we, we, we channel the, the I know when you were asking me uh, about Assange, you were only thinking of me. I, I understand yeah, that. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm interested in your views on the, uh, the future of the World Wide Web, mm -hmm. given cybercrime, cybersecurity, cyber warfare. Is it sustainable or will it inevitably break down into a series of national systems? And the second part of my question is, in the You must have been in the US Congress. <laughs> I would get, sure, I'd like to ask you one question at 17. Pitch, so exactly, you know. exactly. <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, there was a series of cyber events, codenamed Titan Rain, which appeared to be a series of coordinated attempts to uh, intrude into US systems. Uh, now that a bit of time has elapsed, are you able to elaborate and explain what all of that was about? So no, I'm not gonna answer the second question. <laughs> Tried. With, re with respect, remind me again the first question really quick. Uh, World Wide Web. World Wide Web. I think there's two macro issues there. Number one, I think we would all acknowledge, look, if we were creating this system that we use today from the ground up, it wouldn't look like what we have. We would have designed it, we would have built it, we would have created a level of resiliency and redundancy in its basic architecture that, quite frankly, we just didn't put in when we created it. We started this thing under the premise that security was not a basic driver usage levels were gonna be, remember it started as a DOD project in 1969 when the Department of Defense in the United States posed the following question or challenge from DARPA, uh, from IARPA, from ARPA, which is now DARPA in the United States. It's our kind of R&D advanced research uh, organization in the Department of Defense. It went to industry and posed the following question. At the moment, the only way to move large volumes of information are by courier, mail, these electronic, remember we didn't even have fax then. We, we had the electronic drums where you'd put the paper across and go, come on, who's old enough in here to remember that? There you go. <laughs> and DOD was asking itself, isn't there a way that we could somehow move information in, in paper a, a little more effortlessly? And thus ultimately is initially created the internet. We initially built it as the intranet. It's only within DOD. Then we increased the functionality. But when we first designed it, for example, we said things to ourselves like, well, it's unclassified. Nobody would be interested in this as a target. It, we just moved paper and unclassified information. Who would care? We also said to ourselves, well, these are all DOD users. It's, identity is known. Identity is secure. What do we care about identity as a, as, as a core design skill? Hey, look, it's got a very simple administrative function. Why would we need to create redundancy and resiliency in its architecture? So we lose the ability to move paper for a little bit. We'll just mail it, fax it, courier, whatever we always have done. Fast forward now, 53 years later, and the world we find ourselves in now is totally different. So the first, I think, aspect to the question is, do we need, forget about the balkanization, just do we need to readdress the basic structure itself? from a performance, from a security, from a reliability and redundancy. The, 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 you could argue 3.0 in some ways is a part of that. But I would also argue part of the challenge with that is quite frankly, we have billions of dollars of fixed capital investiture in the existing system. And most businesses, I don't necessarily fault them, say I'm not walking away from this kind of in <laughs> investment when it's still functional. The, the other issue is, well, maybe for political or national security or economic purposes, we would decide that perhaps balkanizing it, splitting it up, decoupling. I understand, and, and you can tell, there are some areas of the world where they are aggressively working along those lines. I wonder in my own mind, given the economic models we've created, how, I understand the political dimension here, but economically, how workable is that on a global basis? And we'll have to see. I just don't know. But I know there's efforts to do that ongoing. Thank you. Uh, next question, Colin Clark. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. Admiral, uh, information operations are... Uh, Let me state part. for the record, I do not want to break defense. That would be a mm -hmm. bad thing. <laughs> Understood. Unfortunately, we're owned by a company called Breaking Media, so... Ah, there you go. <laughs> um, the... Uh, Information operations are a key part of what you did for a long time, and the Chinese certainly seem to regard them as a key tool of both diplomacy and warfare. Uh, the United States, as evidenced by our work with ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Russia, China, 
often is far behind in response times and in uh, the purposefulness of the messaging we do. Mm. Uh, how does the United States need to restructure how it approaches this important component of warfare? So part of this is, look, there's a recognition <coughs> of this challenge for us. The Global Engagement Center within the State Department is an example of that. As I, as I look at it, so you take it for what it's worth, <laughs> information operations during the Cold War were a core aspect of our strategy. We spent time and investment, Radio Free Europe, et cetera, trying to come up with the means to promote the flow of information into denied areas, if you will, behind the Iron Curtain. We, we created resources. We created organization and structure. We developed um, skills and expertise that we sustain in terms of human capital that did that for a career. Cold War's over, we're in a different world, and we decide, well, maybe we don't need that so much. So quite frankly, we do away with much of that structure, much of that capability, much of that expertise. 21st century comes along, and we decide, you know, we maybe need to recreate this in some form. And we've spent the last, arguably, couple of decades trying to do that. And quite frankly, we haven't really found the sweet spot yet. We're working our way through it. The, the good news is there is recognition of the problem. The challenge is, well, recognition's not enough. It's how do we get to actual outcomes, guys? And, and there's no one single way to fix this. I, I wish I could tell you, if you do these five things, that's all you need to do. It's, it's just gonna be a long journey, sir. Thank you, and our final question for today is uh, Michael Keating. Okay, so you guys are gonna get the <laughs> I just want you to know, the American is standing up for the population. Fair enough. Michael Keating from uh, Keating Media, Admiral. Sure. Uh, foreign direct interference has become a rising problem here in Australia uh, in the last few years, both politically and uh, socially. Uh, Senator James Patterson, the former head of our Intelligence Committee, proved in numerous cases how China has tried to interfere with Australia's political and social systems. And uh, obviously this is occurring in the US. How do you think we combat this through our Five Eyes partnership operationally and the measures that we can take to combat foreign direct interference? So again, there's no one single thing that you're gonna do. The, the behaviors I've seen, the activities I've seen, some of whom in this room are, are part of this and doing some great things. Number one, you work hard to increase the level of situational awareness across the nations affected. So you share information. Number two, you focus your attempts to understand this. So that means collection prioritization, that means putting expertise, putting capacity against to try to generate that understanding in the first place, that knowledge. You also, in my mind, need to be more comfortable in publicly outing it, publicly shaming it. You know, I was part of discussions in my previous life. Should we publicly acknowledge or attribute this behavior to a specific actor? Do we wanna talk more generically? Should we not say anything publicly? but convey a message privately, directly to the uh, nation states involved in the activity. I think it's a positive that I would argue over the last five years or so, the trend has become much more about public naming and shaming. I, I'm an, I am a proponent of that. My view is um, we gotta be willing to call people out. Again, it goes to my previous point about, look, we gotta hold nations accountable for the things they do. We can't pretend it didn't happen. We can't deny it. We need to ask ourselves, Given the activity, let's understand it, let's acknowledge it, and let's figure out what we can do to attempt to stop it. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Everyone, thank you very much. Admiral, thank you for your time okay. today. Please. Thank you. I, have a, I have a gift of... Uh, the highly wine. coveted Press Club Black Box. Yes. Thank you very, very much. And uh, a membership card gets you into press clubs around the world as well as back here in Australia when you come back again. There's nothing like hanging around press clubs around the world. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very thank much, you much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.